Hi, I'm Julian Baird, photographer and filmmaker from Devon, and welcome to Discovering Dartmoor. A few years ago, I asked myself the question, what do I know about Dartmoor? What makes this place so unique? And when I couldn't answer those questions, I made a commitment to myself to not only see more of Dartmoor, but to learn more about it. And from that commitment, Discovering Dartmoor was born, a five-part video series where I explore and photograph 24 of Dartmoor's finest locations and speak to some of Dartmoor's most passionate ambassadors so I can find out for myself what makes Dartmoor so special. Coming up in this episode, I find the potato cave, I get lost in some bracken, I walk to one of Dartmoor's most remote tours, and I also speak to Tom and Kelly from the Dartmoor Preservation Association to talk to them about the important work that they do. But before all that, let's start my discovering Dartmoor journey at the beginning on the northwest edge of Dartmoor at Arms Tall, where I enjoy the simple pleasure of an evening walk. I start my discovering Dartmoor journey at Arms Tall, which is located on the northwest edge of Dartmoor. It's a pleasant walk of just over two kilometres. Fortunately, the first part was relatively easy as you walk along this wide path with a gentle incline. I could have crossed the river lid by the wooden bridge, but as the water level was low and I was feeling a bit adventurous, I crossed it using the stone steps. After the river crossing, the path splits and I had the option to turn right and take in Brat Tor, but I decided to keep left and go straight to Arms Tor. I'm about halfway up to Arms Tor, which you can just see there behind me. I'm just about to start the steep bit, but already I've got these fantastic views of the surrounding landscape. I've got really good visibility tonight. And it's experiences like this, it's times like this that make you appreciate what Dartmoor has to offer. There's even a couple of Dartmoor ponies over there having a graze. And I already feel reinvigorated, rejuvenated for coming out to Dartmoor. The last bit of the ascent was tough, but I had a good feeling it was going to be worth it. Well, I've made it to the top of Arms Tor, and the view is amazing. What a view! It's amazing up here. I can't wait to have a little look about, see what I can find, and then I'm gonna get the camera out and get ready to take some photographs. This rock here, this is a great example of why I'm making this film about discovering Dartmoor. Because I need to discover how this happened, what sort of geological process went on to create this rock. And this is some of the most amazing things that I've, this is why I photographed Dartmoor, for these shapes and these types of rocks. But I don't know how they happen and I need to increase my knowledge so I've got a much better understanding of the landscape I love to photograph. I really lucked out with the conditions this evening. It has been most pleasant up here on Arms Tour. Now I've got a whole stack of locations to visit on Dartmoor as part of this film. And I know one thing for sure, it's not always gonna be as nice weather as this, but that is part of the fun, as part of the experience of exploring Dartmoor. And I hope you'll join me for the next location. I'll see you then. I can't believe that was my first visit to Arms Tor, but one of the goals for discovering Dartmoor was to visit locations I'd not been to before. So while I might not have learned much at Arms Tor, it was a valuable and enjoyable experience. And sometimes with big projects like this, you just need to make a start. One of my other goals for discovering Dartmoor was that I wanted to speak to some of the people and organizations that have Dartmoor at the center of what they do. One of the organizations I was particularly interested in talking to was the Dartmoor Preservation Association. And when I asked if they'd like to head out onto Dartmoor to have a chat about the work that they do and what their mission was, 
I was delighted when they said yes. So let's join Tom and Kelly from the DPA to find out what they've been doing at Buckland Common. So we're out here on Dartmoor National Park and the reason Dartmoor National Park is the way it is is thanks to all the huge number of people, groups and organisations that help maintain the integrity of the National Park. And I'm very pleased today to be joined by Tom and Kelly from Dartmoor Preservation Association. Thank you very much for uh, joining me Pleasure today. To here. Um, what can you tell me about the DPA? What sort of work do you do? What's your, your, your mission? So the, the DPA has got quite a long history, which we'll be delighted to talk to you about later, but, but really we're the, the largest and oldest membership organisation that helps to look after Dartmoor. Right. We've got a particular interest in archaeology, but also ecology, uh, and we run our own land on the moor. We've had a different roles over the years, but, but right now we act as what's called the critical friends to the National Park. Right. We do some planning vigilance yep. to stop inappropriate development on the moor. Uh, we advocate for public access. Recently, that means backpack camping, but also the rights of graziers. Yep. Uh, and we manage our own land for conservation and ecology. So you've got quite a, a, a wide remit, I guess. Yeah, normally it's one big thing at a time, yeah. but, but overall, yeah, it's quite wide. And there's the constant, the constant work of having yeah. to manage, maintain our land and do the other volunteering processes that we do. So I'd imagine having such a wide remit, you have a lot of staff or? <laughs> well, <Are> you... <laughs> there's three of us yeah. and two of us are here right now. Right, okay um, then. <laughs> uh, I hope so... things haven't shut down back at Princeton then. <laughs> no, it's not a huge staff, yeah. but we've got a really dedicated uh, and long served group of volunteers. Right. We've got a fantastically dedicated uh, trustee board who are very involved uh, operationally when we need them to be, very supportive yeah. about how we use our money for the benefit of the moor uh, and how we how we develop our volunteers and so stuff. It's very much driven by the, the community with similar people with uh, uh, levels of passion. Yeah, I mean, we have members from actually all over the world, yeah. all over the country, a lot of them around here, around the yeah. moor. Um, most of our trustees are from the moor, from Devon, but we are, you know, a very, we're a broad kirk and we're very welcome welcoming i hope yeah. to as many people as possible and you're always always looking for more people i guess to, to, to join and, and yes. help out because you've got a number of projects on the go and i think where are we today then so right now we're on, we're on buckland common yep. which is not one of our own pieces of land but it is somewhere where our volunteers and the dpa have been working yep. for several years on a specific project uh, which has had wonderful effects which i'd love to tell you about so we're at buckland common yeah uh, which is a, a very large landscape with a very yeah. ancient history. So Neolithic, Bronze Age, Medieval and everything in between, yeah. like so many parts of the moor. And the reason I brought you here is that this is a great example of, of the type of project we do. Yeah. So this isn't one of our bits of land. This actually uh, was a project started by the National Park and they needed a little bit of financial support, which we gave them, uh, and a lot of volunteer yeah. and effort support. And when they first proposed this project, this whole area, which is, which is covered, as you've seen, in some fascinating archaeological remains, reeve systems, retaining walls for livestock, very eight thousands of yeah. years old, was completely covered in head high bracken and in other invasive species, and you couldn't see it. We say it's invasive in yeah. as much as it needs to be kept off the archaeology in order to both protect the archaeology, but also to see what's there yeah. for, for people's enjoyment and education. So it was everywhere on this site, head height, and over about four or five years, yeah. our team of volunteers in all weathers were out here cutting raking back, clearing off the archaeology first, and then moving out to clear the whole area you can see here. The repeated application of that work yeah. has meant that the bracken and other invasive species haven't come back. So, so just this area here, how, how big an area have they, did the volunteers clear? The, the whole thing is about four hectares, so it's pretty big. That's a significant amount of work it, then, isn't it? It is, yeah. given that you've got to cut it, you've got to remove it, yeah. and then you've got to keep coming back and doing it. It's a hot sunny day today. <laughs> yeah, that brings its own. You all think it's probably quite nice to be. Well, it's hard, if you, hard if you work for a couple of hours work, in this, yeah. you, you get yeah. a sweat on. But the other end of the spectrum, it's freezing cold and yeah. blowy in winter, and they're still out here doing that work. It doesn't even have to be winter, does it? <laughs> it doesn't it? Dartmoor, does it? So there's a real dedication <laughs> yeah. by people over yeah. many years. And what you can see here is the result of that, which is that we can now see these beautiful hut circles. We can see the enclosure walls. Yeah. We can see the reef systems that run away, and and uh, that that run off from from the the huts. And the effect that's had is that by clearing yeah. the cover, it does allow grazing animals, both wild horses, but also farmed uh, cows to get in here and sort of to be a, to be a lawnmower, if you like, right. to, to keep, to keep the, the, the species off the archeology span and to keep the grass low so it can be seen. Uh, and the reason that's important is that this is an ancient landscape yeah. and we need people to understand that it's important to us. Uh, it's the type of work that only volunteers can do. And we have some wonderful volunteers. Uh, we've been able to provide a little bit of financial support uh, and it's a partnership arrangement. Yeah. So it's a partnership with the National Park, it's a partnership with us, and really to our volunteers. And what that has meant was that people can come here and not only see this astonishing view, which takes in so much of the moor, 
but also appreciate that there is a really ancient landscape here uh, and it's really everywhere. Yeah. Dartmoor is sort of per acre, one of the richest archaeological areas anywhere in Europe that is undeveloped. It's so it's, it's more than just hills and tours and lovely views, isn't it? There's a, there's a lot of yes. history here, isn't there? And I think you know the, the work that your volunteers do, I guess, allows that to be exposed and maintained for everyone yes, to enjoy. Exactly that. And, and other groups. Yeah. And we work with many people, but you're right. Uh, Dartmoor is essentially a human landscape. Yeah. Uh, it has been altered pretty much since the end of the last ice age, particularly in the last couple of thousand years. And, and that has all become part of its story and its history. And that's what makes it look the way it is now, including yeah. grazing by livestock. So, and, and grazing happens on this, this bit of land. And where you've done the clearing and, and you've got the, the bracken here, that's a kind of natural barrier, is it? It's yeah, just... so exactly that. Uh, in due course, it may well sort of re-infiltrate, yeah. ingress back in. Uh, so it's an effort that needs to be kept yeah. up. But as with so many things, the hardest bit is the first effort. And once it's done, it, it can be maintained. But yes, this morning I was, I was down here. Uh, there were wild ponies. Uh, there were there were cows. The whole yeah. thing was lovely, Id idyllic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah idyllic. Uh, so I believe and one of the things you just said there is we've got some prehistoric mm -hmm. items to, to look at as a result of the clearing. Should we go and have a look at those as well? Yeah, by all means, yes. I see some hot circles. Nice bit of history there. We'll rejoin Tom and Kelly from the DPA a bit later in this episode. But for now, let's continue my Discovering Dartmoor journey and head southwest from Princeton to Blacktor, where I discover something I never expected to see on Dartmoor. This evening, I'm going to take a look at Black Tor, which is about a mile and a half from Princeton on the western side of Dartmoor. Fortunately for me, the walk to Black Tor is short and flat. It's a beautiful evening with barely a breath of wind and a lot of white, fluffy clouds in the sky. Black Tor is just a few hundred metres from the road, but I'm going to take some extra time this evening to look at something rather interesting. I follow the path south from Black Tor and down the hill towards the River Meavy, where I find something I wasn't expecting to find on Dartmoor. What did I find? An aqueduct. I had no idea that Dartmoor had aqueducts. This aqueduct forms part of the Devonport Leet, which used to flow all the way to Plymouth Docks. It now just feeds into a nearby reservoir. Historically, the area around Blacktor was the hub of the tin industry on Dartmoor. I mostly associate Cornwall with tin, so learning that Dartmoor had a similar industry was fascinating. As I explored the area, I found traces of Dartmoor's industrial history, including the ruins of these blown houses located in the plantations to the south. I'm having a wonderful time this evening capturing landscape photographs. Maybe even better when you get fantastic tours like this and these beautiful Dartmoor grasses, something I really love photographing. But if I just step across to the side here, some of my photographs or some of the compositions I've been picking have been impacted by that object over there. That's the uh, big mast over at Princeton. Massive object, can't escape it. Well, you can escape it if you go over there and take pictures in that direction, but sometimes I want to be over there capturing photographs this way. But it does remind me that many of the places I've been to Dartmoor over the years, it's rare that I've really been truly remote, that I've been away from where man has been, whether it's roads or structures or something like that. So I do wonder on my travels, will I be able to get truly remote into the deepest, darkest Dartmoor and escape the impact of man. Another brilliant evening on Dartmoor draws to a close. It's just so exciting being out here and discovering more of Dartmoor. 
I can't wait to get to the next location. I'll see you then. There's so much to discover on Dartmoor, even in the small area around Black Tor. Now, while I was out on Buckland Common with the DPA, Tom took me to see a Bronze Age hut circle. But before we rejoin Tom and learn about this fascinating archaeological site, here's a quick message from me. I just want to quickly interrupt this episode of Discovering Dartmoor to say a big thanks to you, the people that are watching. Discovering Dartmoor for me is a passion project, not a commercial venture or a profit-making exercise. Everything that went into this series was produced by me. All the planning, research, writing, scouting, on-location filming, interviews, photography and editing was all done by just me. I even did my own hair, makeup and wardrobe. But the best bit of all that work is that I get to share Discovering Dartmoor with you on YouTube for free forever. So if you've got this far through the episode, it probably means you're enjoying it. And if you are, then it makes all that hard work worth it. But you might also be saying, Julian, how can I show my support for this wonderful series? Well, there are three simple things you can do that would mean the world to me, and that's like, comment, and share. So if you are enjoying this episode, you'll find a like button just underneath the video. Press that, and then just below that, you can leave me a comment, preferably a nice one. But the most important and best thing you can do is to share the video. Let your friends, family and colleagues know about the series. Talk to them, WhatsApp them, share it in a Facebook group. However you do it, it would mean the world to me. But if you really like discovering that more and you want to show your appreciation by buying me a cup of coffee, then that would be truly amazing. Just below the video, next to the like button, you'll find the thanks button. By clicking that, you can make a one-time donation. That, in all likelihood, I will actually spend on coffee. I love coffee. As a landscape photographer that loves photographing sunrise, I depend on coffee. It keeps me going. But please do like, comment, and share. Right, thank you for listening. Now let's get back to the episode. So Tom, this looks rather interesting. And what have we got here then? So what you've got is, is the remains of a Bronze Age hut circle, of yep. which there are several in this area and then many, many groupings of them yeah. all over the moor. Uh, and what you're looking at here is what would have been the base wall, would have been about a metre and a half tall, maybe a bit smaller, and then covered over either with thatch or turf. And that's where a whole group of family would have lived. And it, you may not be able to see, but maybe you can look later. You can see that around the edge of it, there's a large retaining wall or the remains of one. You would have had a, a hut circle where the family would have lived and then their own kind of home animal range, if yeah. you like, for safety. And then the animals uh, would, have, would have been out on the moor. Um, and people tended to live in sort of communities. So there's five or six, well, at least nine of them here. Several more that we probably haven't even identified going off that way towards Rippentor. And they're all over the moor. And what you're seeing there yeah. is that in that ton of time, which is anywhere from sort of, sort of about three and a half thousand years ago, is that the, the moor would really have been a really busy, you know, an interesting, busy place full of, full of families, full of life, and a whole community of people living their lives here, as they have done all the way through to the present day. That's fascinating. And you didn't actually know this was here until you started to, to well, clear the line? Or did so, so, you have an idea, maybe? So, yeah. So the National Park understood that these these bigger features were yeah. here, definitely, um, because they're, they're, that you can see them from the air and you know you can find yeah. them as you walk along. But the danger is, is the bracken and other invasive right. species were, were simply getting in the way of being able to see them, to understand them in their broader context. And definitely features such as some of the reeves and some of the smaller walls yeah were being lost yet yeah, to, to, to the bracken and other things. It's, it's interesting that you say that this would have been quite a, a busy place, Dartmoor, because I, I always imagine when I've, when I've come across these things, I think, oh, it's a bunch of people living in quite a remote, quite harsh conditions, but maybe that's not the case, that there would have been bigger communities. Well, when I, uh, I use busy advisedly. <laughs> you know, it's, if you look around you now... It's, it's not it's, Newton Abbott Town yeah. Centre. Well, saying. exactly, and it's not super busy today. No. But nor was it an empty wasteland. Yeah. And, you know, it never has been that. It's always been environmentally rich always been an environment for humans um, and in fact if you look across Europe more broadly yeah. uh, Bronze Age Europe was in fact a very sort of bustling place yeah. you may not have had, you know, there's no Paris or Rome as you say no new Abbots but that you know there were trade there was trans transcontinental trade there was transcontinental movement of animals there was the movement of ideas uh, you know and, and Dartmoor and Devon and the UK were very much part of that trans-European yeah. uh, Bronze Age culture. So there's lots of these sites all across Dartmoor, isn't it? There's some of the bigger, smaller ones. There's yes. quite a variety. They're all over the moor. Yeah. This is one of the better preserved ones, which is why this entire common area 
is the premier archaeological landscape and managed so carefully by the National Park. Uh, but one thing you get on, on Dartmoor is because of the relative lack of development, although there has been consistent yeah. use over many thousands of years, so much of this archaeological heritage, be it medieval or uh, industrial revolution or tin yeah. mining or Bronze Age or anything like that, is all here side by side. So it's a fantastic kind of capsule history of, of the history of the UK and this area. And, and I guess you, you and your volunteers help maintain these areas so people can come and have a look at them for themselves. Yeah, this is really testament to, to two things, to partnership working yeah. with the National Park and others uh, and to the hard work of the volunteers. And this has been a success for the DPA volunteers who have come year in, year out, whilst we've been funding the project. And I've got to say, after we stopped funding the project. So this is a sort of labour of love for many people. And it's been really successful. Uh, they have they have done something that is of value to them all, that people can come and see. Yeah. It's useful for education. You get to see this fantastic view that you would otherwise not have. Um, yeah, and it's, it's really been a labour of love for them. Yeah. I have to say that learning just a little bit about Dartmoor's rich history was fascinating. I had no idea Dartmoor had such a long history of humans living and working on Dartmoor. We'll rejoin my conversation with the DPA a bit later when we learn about the history of the DPA with Kelly. But before that, I'm going to head to a couple of interesting locations near Burrata Reservoir, one of which has a cave. An evening's walk in Dartmoor during the summer really is one of life's great pleasures. The trees are full of life and covered in leaves. The flora and fauna are rich and vibrant. And today is a fine evening for a walk. I also had time to have a closer look at the smaller things that grow in Dartmoor. It's a decent walk up to the tour, but there is plenty to see, both organic and man-made. My walk takes me close to Cuckoo Rock, but before I head up there, there's something interesting I'm eager to find. The first place I wanted to come up at this area was to this cave here. Now, the reason I know about this cave is because I've been doing a little bit of reading up about the local area. I've got some books on Dartmoor, and this here was located in one of the books that I had, and I thought it was really cool to come here and look. Now, it's been a bit of an effort to get here. I've been walking through some long bracken, so I'm a little bit wet, but it's been really worth it. I wouldn't want to spend any time in there, I have to admit. Um, it was apparently used by uh, workers, used to come around here, used to store their tools in here. And later on, when this land was getting farmed, and when he, uh, the farmer eventually moved to be only being able to farm potatoes, he used to use this as his potato store. I think it's now nicknamed the Potato Cave. But what a little find, quite hard to, to find, but well worth hunting out. Well, I've made a cuckoo rock. It's bigger than I thought it was. So here we have Cuckoo Rock, and doesn't it look absolutely fantastic? Now, again, I was doing some research, trying to find out why it's called Cuckoo Rock. It doesn't appear to be a definitive answer. Some say it's something to do with cuckoos or even to do with the shape of the rock. But, you know, that aside, sometimes you just have to sit back and enjoy it for what it is. Well, I've not had far to walk from Cuckoo Rock and I'm at the tour already. And it looks pretty spectacular from here. I'm looking forward to getting up there and having a look. Wow. If nothing else, this tour gives you pretty fantastic views. I've got this fantastic natural amphitheatre here, which unfortunately I can see here the ground has been damaged by what looks like people lighting fires, perhaps having a barbecue down here, which is a bit of a shame. It's a shame people can't come up here 
and just appreciate the landscape without having to leave their mark. It's a bit of a shame. Now for my two for one special, I'm gonna head over in that direction for sunset over to Down Tor. Sky is looking quite dramatic. Sun might drop down below those clouds and I might get some really nice light. So I think it's gonna be worth the dash over there. Let's go. I just want to interrupt this episode of Discovering Dartmoor to talk to you about the photography of Discovering Dartmoor. Throughout my Discovering Dartmoor journey, I've been capturing landscape photographs of the locations I have visited, some of which you will have already seen in this episode. And while I am very proud to share my Discovering Dartmoor landscape photographs in this video series, for me, the best way to view any photograph is in the printed format. We're all used to scrolling through photographs on social media platforms, but viewing a photograph in printed format is a totally different experience. It's a richer, more engaging experience. And that's why I'm incredibly excited to let you know that I've collated all 55 landscape photographs from the Discovering Dartmoor series and published them in this small soft cover book or as it's more commonly known these days, a zine. All 55 landscape photographs from the video series are included, from arms tour to yes tour and everything in between. The zine is printed professionally using high quality papers on both the cover and inner pages ensuring my photographs are displayed in the best possible way. There's also an introduction written by myself and a foreword that has been written by Max Piper. Max has a deep connection with Dartmoor and is also the author of the book East Dartmoor's Lesser Known Tours. So I was delighted when he agreed to write the foreword for my publication. You'll also see Max feature in one of the Discovering Dartmoor episodes if you haven't seen him already. Landscape photography is my passion and being able to publish this collection of Discovering Dartmoor photographs is one of the highlights of producing this series. If you'd like to purchase a copy, then just head to discoveringdartmoor.com where you can order one today. Now, one final thing, if you're looking for something a bit bigger, such as a print to hang on your wall, then there is also a limited collection of Discovering Dartmoor photographs to purchase as individual prints. Again, just head to discoveringdartmoor.com for more details. Thank you for your time, and now back to the episode. Whew, I made it just, even though there's still about 20 minutes before sunset, the gap between the upper layer of cloud and the cloud on the horizon was really small and I could spot it from over there. So I had to run with my backpack to get all over here to get the photographs, but I'm glad I did. I got a five minutes with the light, it was really nice. After the excitement of running here and capturing those photographs, just kind of a little sit down, little rest, and admire the view, which you can see over there in the distance, you can see the reservoir, uh, and the dam is actually at the other end. There are a number of waterways that feed into this particular reservoir. One of them is the Devonport Leet, which we visited already, the one with the, the waterfall coming down the hill. So it's nice to see where that particular bit ends up. But that reservoir, or well, the dam was finished in 1898, I believe, and it holds a capacity of a thousand million gallons of water. That's a whole lot of water. Wow, what an adventure it's been this evening. In fact, it's just starting to cloud over. I think it might rain, so I better make a beeline to the car. But it's been a big walk, but I think it's been well worth trying to get two locations in. I've visited some really interesting things like Potato Cave and saw where the farming used to happen down there, learned a little bit about the reservoir. I've learned quite a lot tonight, but there is still so much more to discover on Dartmoor. So I'll see you at the next location.
Wow, that was such an amazing evening. Two fantastic tours surrounded by so much history. Let's rejoin my conversation now with the DPA, where Kelly is going to tell us about the history of the DPA. Kelly, thank you for joining me. I believe you're the kind of uh, the historian of the of the DPA. <laughs> what can you tell me uh, about the history of the DPA? Well, we were formed at a very interesting point in history. Yeah. It was in 1893, so we are at the height of industrialization, but also really seeing the effects of the Enclosures Act, right. which happened over the 18th and 19th centuries, and that really was about uh, tenement farmers who had the rights of commoners to farm lands such as Dartmoor yeah. were being told to leave. These lands were being enclosed for productivity of the landowner. And many of the people at this point ended up fleeing to the cities oh, right. to pursue factory work there. So you see a, a mass exodus of, of agricultural areas over this time. And I guess the problem with when people leave a land is the land often dies and you need, you need the people here to make a land thrive, don't you? Yes, and, and for these people, it's very much part of their heritage. Yeah. It's the only thing that they know, and it's it's very much part of, of Devon culture, and, and our heritage yeah. is, is the rights of commoners and common farming. And yes, absolutely, yeah. um, the land was a lot different and is a mass social upheaval at this time. We became a force for advocating for the rights of, of the common man at yeah. this point, basically. Um, and yeah, ensuring these people can stay. So we we started campaigning in the nineties on behalf of of specific plaintiffs yeah. and, and people asking for our help, and also looking at the natural. It was a time. It's also a time of the Romantics, remember. <laughs> so it was very much a time of looking at this beautiful land that's coming yeah. out in all of, of of popular culture at the time, and thinking, wow. This land is our land. Yeah. Um, so it was a time for protecting this this precious thing and the rights of the people that live in it and that their livelihood depends on it. What other things have you done over the, say, the last 100 years in a big, big campaigns? And Yes, the last 100 years has been a, a huge period of change for everywhere and Dartmoor is no different. So World War One happened and after World War I, uh, the Forestry Commission was yeah. founded in 1919, which looked to plant a lot of conifers everywhere yeah. across Dartmoor. And as much as we are very pro planting yeah. trees, it's got to be the best. It's yeah. got to be the right tree in the right place. And we worked very, very hard to campaign against inappropriate developments, even such as um, afforestation. Yeah. That was an, that was probably one of our first tasks yeah. in, in the 20th century. And then loads of reservoirs started being built, which again very useful for towns and cities, but you've got to look at the landscape and yeah. how it's going to affect the archaeology, the ecology. And then as the 20th century has kind of gone along, we've seen other issues such as World War II meant that military expansion yeah. on Dartmoor happened, which then led us to look at ways in which it was maybe being mis uh, misused, yeah. maybe being unsafe. And we published quite a few pieces of literature around the time about different shells and yeah and live fire that's been left on Dartmoor and what it means for people who are trying to access it. So we've had environmentalists, we've had access campaigners, we've had everybody sort of working towards all of these different yeah. aims and this, it really is a massive I mean, I mean access is an, an important thing, it's particularly with the military because they've got very large areas of Dartmoor for, for those military zones and yes. imagine if the DPA hadn't campaigned against you know, or losing those access rights, you know, the large parts of the mall would still be probably out of bounds, wouldn't they? Absolutely. And I think that this is the way in which the, our, our charity now has this strength in the fact that we have these open channels of yeah. communication and are really well respected. Yeah. Well, what are the cu current challenges and how is the DPA sort of changing its way and using social media to kind of stay, not just stay relevant, but stay, stay engaged? I think since since the evolution of um, social media yeah. especially, you have a lot more questions and a lot more queries and issues yeah. coming up about how we treat Dartmoor yeah. and how we access it. And I think that's a very important role to play. And it's it's good. This is where the reactive side yeah. comes into issues because there are questions crawling into our inbox constantly. And it's about educating people on the appropriate use of mm -hmm. the more whilst retaining those rights. That's really important yeah. to us. So I guess while while the DBA has I guess changed and grown over the years, yep. I kind of its core mission statement and, and its future kind of remains the remains the same with having Dartmoor as its heart. Absolutely, yes. It's Dartmoor is our heart, and we want to protect the past, yep. and we also want to retain it for the future. 
So we're now looking at possible education opportunities yeah. and engaging more young people and looking at how we can really help combine the sort of past of, yeah. our, of our charity and the future of Dartmoor. Well, here's to another 140 years yes, at least anyway. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Kelly. Thank you. It was really interesting listening to Kelly talk about the history of the DPA. It just shows you how much power people can have when they get together for a common cause. We'll come back to my conversation with the DPA a bit later in this episode, but for now, let's head to East Dartmoor to find out what a Logan stone is. The walk to Easton is around two and a half kilometres and starts off with a pleasant walk along a wooded lane. At the end of the lane, a gate leads you into a managed woodland, which is beautiful in its own stark and uniform way. The more recent woodland soon gives way to something a bit more ancient and so I take the time to sit back and enjoy it. After a short break, I continue my walk out from the woods where I find the bracken has grown to head height. Bracken is so high, it would be easy to get lost in it. My adventure through the Bracken soon comes to an end, and I'm finally in some open moorland. Along the way, I come across a rock formation called Figgy Daniel. It's rather an odd shaped tour, and it's bigger than it looks. Just a short walk up from Figgy Daniel and I'm on the highest elevation along the hill. Here the view really opens up and at this time of year it is nothing short of spectacular. Well, here I am in Easton Tor and the views as you can come to expect from Dartmoor are absolutely fantastic. But before I get on to that, here we are with one of the trig points. Now apparently, I've done a little bit of reading up about this because I saw this on the map before I came up here. There are 32 of these trig points on Dartmoor. I wonder how many of them I actually discovered on my adventures. They're not used anymore. We've got GPS and sat-nav and satellite imagery now. Does all the hard work for us. But they're dotted about. I'll keep an eye out for them. But before I talk more about Easton Tor, there's something I just want to go and have a look down there. I'm not going to go too far because there's the light. I think it's going to be quite fleeting tonight. There's a lot of cloud, but there's little holes in there that the sun's going to break through. So I want to be here to take the pictures when the light happens. So yeah, let's go and have a look down here. what I wanted to come and look at. This is called Whoopin Rock or Hoopin Rock. I'll put the spelling up below. I'm not quite sure the, the pronunciation. I'm pretty sure it's Whoopin. But why I wanted to come and see this, apart from its geological features, it's apparently this bit I'm standing on here, well, I think it's this bit anyway, was once a Logan stone. Now these were used by the Druids apparently. Now they're supposed to, I think, supposed to wobble a little bit. That naturally happens through the erosion over time, but this one doesn't seem to Want to wobble onto us. I'm a little bit too high up here. I'm a bit worried about wobbling it too much and me taking a tumble. But it's really interesting. I didn't know what a Logan stone was, and I've stood in this type of wobbly rock before. I didn't know. There you go. You learn something. This is what happens when you go in a bit of discovering Dartmoor, isn't it? Right. Back up to Easton Tor. Now, I really like it up here because got these great fantastic views. I mean, I can see for miles 
today. I, mean, I know I've been to a few places on Dartmoor and I've talked about the views, but this is something else. What I am waiting for is I'm waiting for the sky to clear because I was promised by the weather forecast clear blue skies, but looking around with the amount of cloud that there is, that's not looking likely tonight. Just so relaxing and so peaceful up here. Well, I think my time here at Easton is done. It's not quite sunset yet, but very heavy cloud over there, so I think I've had the best of the light. But as always, coming out, getting lots of fresh air, standing on top of a hilltop, and looking at Dartmoor. What a better way to spend the evening. I'll see you at the next one. Wow, what a view that was. Well worth navigating through all that bracken. Okay, let's join Tom from the DPA one last time as he tells me about how the DPA works with other organisations to help protect and maintain Dartmoor. Now, it's been really interesting talking to, to you and Kelly and, and looking at all the, the projects that you get involved in and all the great work that you've been doing. Uh, but you don't do that all on your own, do you? No, uh, and increasingly we find that partnership working is, is absolutely critical. In fact, we, we would prefer to work in a partnership yeah. environment. Quite often that's with the National Park, which as you can imagine is a, is a huge sort of partner here on yeah. the moor, obviously. But there's loads of other wonderful uh, organisations and groups, some with specific interests uh, that we'd like to work with. And you know, Recently we've been working with uh, wonderful groups like the South West Peatland Partnership, looking to restore peatland on the moor with something called Our Upland Commons, which helps support uh, common farmers, so people who farm the common land in uphill situations. Uh, the Hill Farming Project, similar kind of thing. Um, and we've recently both got involved with and started funding a youth engagement ranger in concert with the National Park, whose job is really to go out to people who live near the moor but haven't got the opportunity yeah. to access it. So facilitating access for people who wouldn't otherwise do it. Um, we're looking to get our More Boots program going again this year, which is where we provide outdoor equipment uh, to underprivileged yeah. children so they can access oh, them more. So it's not just about us funding things, which we do, it's our partnership working that really makes us, you know, really makes us gel and, and effective on the more. And the reason for that is so many of their, those other organizations interests yeah. overcross with ours because, you know, we're not looking to preserve the more like some kind of museum. We're not to set in yeah. an aspect just for us. What we want is to preserve the bits of the more really for, for future generations. You know, things that, that we have been lucky enough to receive from people who preserved them in the past and then hand them on to our children and grandchildren. So preservation is really about the future. Yeah. Because I mean Dartmoor's a living, growing, changing yep. environment. And Working it's important to protect some of the, the, the historical stuff, but also move with the times and, and, and get that greater engagement and get more people out here enjoying this place. Yeah, there's a kind of three-way tension. You're right, it's a living, working environment and there are many thousands of people who make their livelihoods off the moor and we mustn't ever forget that. Uh, it's also an incredibly important historical environment, so we need to keep that so that you know we can understand that and people can appreciate it in the future. But also, as you say, some of the, the threats, if you like, you, know, you talk about climate change and things of that nature, a lot of the current debates about biodiversity and rewilding you know, as Kelly mentioned earlier, so many of the of the things that affect the more are changing and, yeah. and we need to kind of move with, them with it and preserve what is really important whilst flexible enough to, to be ready for the future. So obviously we've talked about volunteers. So how, how can people get involved with uh, the DPA and what sort of people are you looking for? We're looking for everyone and anyone. <laughs> and they don't just have to come from Dartmoor yeah. or Devon. They can come from anywhere. We, we are open to all. Of course, join. You're very welcome to yeah. join. Uh, we have volunteer opportunities both to do work on our own land land management but also things like we saw at Buckland yeah. uh, you know, to clear archaeology and support the national park uh, they can donate of course uh, we have individual projects such as our backpack camping yeah. fundraiser which we're running right now uh, and there's always little things to do in the office so there's many ways to get involved but please join as a member come and help us on volunteering days everyone is welcome so there's plenty for people to do there's always yes. work to be done isn't there's there? always work to be done <laughs> well Tom and Kelly, thank you so much for your time. I've really appreciated it and it's been really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers I had such an amazing afternoon on Buckland Common with Tom and Kelly from the DPA and I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Remember to check out their website for all the ways that you can help support their valuable work. But now, the next and final location for this episode is a tour that I've always wanted to visit but I've always been put off a little by how remote it was and how tricky it can be to get there. But with discovering Dartmoor, there would never be a better reason to go to Dartmoor's most remote tour. So I put on my big boy boots 
and head into Fur Tour. I start my journey to Dartmoor's most remote tour at the Oakhampton firing range. I take the car as far as I can and then I use my bike to cycle along the military road. The military roads made the cycling easy despite the occasional river crossing. The road ends just short of Hanging Stone Hill so I walk my bike up the final few metres to the summit. I leave my bike behind the lookout hut and cross my fingers it will be there when I get back. I then start the long walk out into the open moorland. It's not long before I start to really feel a sense of being remote. Despite the landscape being apparently barren, there are still traces of life. The landscape is almost featureless and the walking is hard going. After a while though, Furtor comes into view and despite it still being quite far away, I'm encouraged to keep walking. By the time I get to Cut Hill, Furtor is only a short walk away. On the final stretch, I'm reminded how hard life can be out here. Well, <laughs> looks like I've finally made it. Look, there's Furtor in the background. What a walk it's been. It's been hard, I think is the best way I can describe it. But I'm finally here at Dartmoor's most remote tour. And just look at this scenery, it's absolutely fantastic. I know I say that every time I come to a new location, but this, this is something else. So I'm gonna go up there and have a well-deserved break. I'll speak to you in a minute. So welcome to Fur Tour. It's rather windy up here. But to be honest, I'd rather it was hull in a gale and I had these clear blue skies because the journey, particularly from Hanging Stone Hill to Black Hill, was really tricky. I mean, there's no path at all. It was all boggy and really tough underfoot. It wasn't particularly pleasant, wasn't very easy going. It's a little bit better once I got up to Cut Hill and then I came along the ridge line to here it was a wee bit easier. I even spotted a few runners out, but I suspect they were coming from the post bridge route. So yeah, I'm so glad I came up here in a blue sky, sunny day. And it's not been raining here for quite some time as well. So most of the ground was dry underfoot because that boggy bit, that would have been horrendous if the ground had been properly wet and navigation would have been almost impossible. I mean, it's featureless up here. But that all aside, that tough walk got me here. And I've just had a little look about and had a sandwich and had to relax. And it's amazing, it's really stunning. I'm gonna have another look about and I'll show you some of the highlights of this location. It might be a tough walk to get here, but I got a funny feeling it was well worth the effort. Well, I have to say, this is quite an interesting rock formation. It looks like these rocks are toppling down, but somehow they've either got stuck or they're frozen in time. Don't want to push it too much. I wouldn't want that landing on my head. I wonder how that started. Looks like it's been worn away. And at some point it probably has toppled and just got stuck. That's amazing. I did just try and get to the top of Fur Tour there. I almost made it, but it's super windy the other side, and I was quite worried that if I got up to the top there, that I might be blown off. And trust me, this is not the location to have an accident, because it's remote. I know, I think I said in an, an earlier episode, I wondered if I'd ever find somewhere that's truly remote in Dartmoor. I think I found it, because as I look about, I can see places I recognise, but they're miles away, absolutely miles away. And there's, you know, the odd path here, 
where people are walking about and a couple of animal tracks. You get the odd lookout post from the, from the military. But other than that, it's just this barren landscape of rolling hills. So definitely not the place to have an accident. But looking about, the rock formations are really interesting. And it's quite, it's a bigger tour than I thought it was. You've got the main stack here with that tumbling rock. Then you've got lots of these individual stacks dotted about. Absolutely fascinating place. I'm gonna make the long journey now back to the car. But, you know, coming here, it's been well worth it to finally come to Dartmoor's most remote tour, and it did not disappoint. Okay, the photography probably wasn't that good today, but I knew if that was gonna be the case on a blue sky day like this, but what a better day to do a walk like this, because you need the views, you need to be able to see and enjoy the walking, because it's about coming to these places, not just the photography. And, you know, one day I do hope, despite the distance, I will get back to Fur Tour and have another look at it, because it's, it's brilliant. Have you ever seen such an amazing view? Dartmoor really does deliver in spades. I'll see you in the next one. There you have it, the first episode of Discovering Dartmoor. It feels amazing to finally be able to share it with you, and I really hope you enjoyed it. This might be the end of episode one though, but there's a lot to look forward to in episode two, including I visit one of Dartmoor's most important historical sites. I discover what all those lines and cracks are in the tours of Dartmoor. I tell you a ghost story. And I have a conversation with Dartmoor author and photographer, Josephine Collingwood. But before you go, if you want to support Discovering Dartmoor, remember that the best way you can do so is by clicking on that like button, leaving a comment, and sharing the video. It would mean the world to me if you told everyone you know about this series. And remember to check out discoveringdartmoor.com, where you can order the Discovering Dartmoor zine or order prints to hang on your wall. You'll also find information about the talk I've written about the photography and film production of Discovering Dartmoor. So if you have a camera club or a group, that would like to know even more about this series, then there's a contact form there as well. Please get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, that's it for episode one. I'll see you for the second episode of Discovering Dartmoor.